Well, to understand the urban-rural divide in politics, you have to understand what Oklahoma was like in 1906 and 1907 when the men who wrote the state constitution gathered in Guthrie and said, we're going to create a new state. Largely, it was a rural frontier. Cities had not grown. Some people say it didn't grow because of labor or for whatever reason, but largely the Indian Territory was withheld from settlement. So as you had cities like Gainesville on the south, in Ark City on the north, in Fort Smith on the east, they were developed on the borders because you had no major cities within the territory. And then you get the first railroads through in the 1870s and 1880s, and you get some small cities, and I include Oklahoma City and Guthrie in that. You know, we were still only uh, about 10,000 people in 1900. And so it was largely a rural community. The threat would have been the railroads, big business coming in and taking all their profits away because they charged higher rates during harvest season. Uh, they saw the merchants in town, the bankers charging them uh, high rates and then the banks going out of business and losing their money. So this would have been an anti-business, anti-centralized authority, very much a Scots-Irish culture coming in with the rural population from Appalachia, from the south, bringing this Scots-Irish culture here, blending with the settlement patterns on the land. And so it's, don't, you're not going to take my gun away from me because this is my valley. And I don't want those feds telling me what to do. They didn't even want someone in Oklahoma City or Guthrie telling them what to do. My county commissioner, that I know and that I vote for, and I see him every day in the cafe, that's the government that I want to work with. Keep it local. The rural element had control, and it was set up to keep that control. A weak governor, because a weak governor would represent centralized authority. Speaker of the House was the most important and most powerful position in this new experiment called the state of Oklahoma. And no surprise, Alfalfa Bill Murray said that's the position he wanted because the Speaker of the House and the House would pretty much establish those first institutions such as University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma A&M as a land-grant college, the Teachers College in Edmond, now UCO, uh, where the penitentiary would go, organizations like the Oklahoma Historical Society, very much a rural-dominated culture. And so they had it. Each county had one senator. Well, what would happen from 1907 on into our history is changing demographics. Industrialization of farming, going to tractors, combines, production goes up. Suddenly, a sharecropper with a mule, a plow, a bunch of kids cannot make a middle class living farming 40 acres of cotton. That might have worked in 1898. Well, it's not working by 1918, 1928, 1938, 48. You have one big shift in the 1960s. The federal courts get involved and say, each county having its own senator, with Oklahoma County, Tulsa County's having one senator, Cimarron County, one senator. It was not one vote, equal representation. Federal courts get involved, they reapportion. Suddenly, Cimarron County does not even have a senator, shares a senator with other counties. Oklahoma and Tulsa counties have multiple senators. You start a shift, but it's only gradually felt because the veterans who had been there for decades still knew how to govern. They knew all the tricks. They had all the major chairmanships. They had the, the reins of power still in their hands, even with this, this change in the rules. And you really don't see the results of that transition until the 80s and 90s. And by this time, you start getting a change in politics. Suburban would be the major change, because today I see it's not just an urban-rural split, it's an urban-rural-suburban split. And then this rural constituency has fewer people, less money. So in a world where money begins to count even more in campaigns, and that's been accelerated in just the last few years, that favors the urban side of this divide. Even today, uh, the rural element is having a hard time getting their message out. And in the, the urban leadership that has reached out into the state is deciding who will run, who will be recruited, who will be uh, nurtured, who will be groomed to be able to run 
not only in the primary, but in the general. I think probably the biggest factor in reversing the demographic shift from rural to urban is the internet. But we've got to have high-speed internet connections, infrastructure, which requires, that will require us as a community. People talk about government as if it's some other entity. Well, government is us speaking with a common voice. It's our corporate structure to do the greatest good for the greatest number. We as this community have got to decide that yes, we've got to help our brothers and sisters in those small towns. And yes, we will contribute to this fund, which is taxation, to, to, to really increase the ability for people to stay in their towns and still connect to do their business, to tap into markets, to, to express their creative self. I think we will get there. I think it's going to take a few hard knocks, a few bad budget years for people to say, wait a minute, maybe the track we're on right now is not the right track. But uh, the urban-rural divide, uh, the divide in wealth, uh, the divide in demographics, the east to the west, tribal governments thrown into this, uh, I think it's all changing very rapidly before our very eyes, and we will see new trends here soon.